I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This is an interview I recorded with Sir Roderick Floud, author of An Economic History of the English Garden. The book charts the economics surrounding English gardens since the 17th century and talks about private gardens, public spaces, professions related to gardening and the often eye-watering amounts of money spent on achieving a bigger and better garden. Sir Roderick calculates the cost of yesteryear's gardens in today's money and it's worth reading the book alone to find out how much the likes of Capability Brown earned or the amounts spent on the gardens of Versailles. He starts by explaining what led him to write the book. I'm an economic historian, and that means that what I'm interested in is the history of particularly the British economy and of the people uh, who made it. And so when I look at um, historical um, institutions or places or buildings, one of the things that occurs to me, and it occurred to me about the Great Gardens, and and indeed the small gardens, is how much did it all cost? Um, It's very beautiful, but it must have cost an enormous amount of money, if you look at a place like Stowe or Hartwell or Haynes Hill or something, to uh, create and maintain. Uh, Where did the money come from? Um, Who were the people who did the work, and how were they paid, and what was their their career? So a whole series of questions that occur to me when I look at Um, a building or a garden from the past. Um, What I found when I started to look at it was that um, very few other people, as it is at all, had asked this question, and therefore there was very little information about it. Sometimes odd money numbers were uh, quoted, uh, how much something had cost, but they were never really put into context, so I don't think anybody really understood what they meant. So given that nobody had looked at this, either from the perspective of garden history or actually from the perspective of economic history, um, I set out to do it myself. And um, 10 or 15 years later, the book is the result. That's a lot of research. Um, And it made me think when you were talking, I didn't put this question in the um, questions that I sent over. So apologies for that. But I wondered, do we spend as extravagantly on gardens now as we did historically? Um, I don't think that one really knows um, because it's impossible to, although we can estimate how much we spend on gardens now, which is well in excess of £11 billion pounds a year, um, it's just very difficult to know how much was spent in the past. Um, I think the answer probably is that we're spending more now than we did in the past. Um, but that's more of a hunch than um, a um, finished finding, if you like. Hmm. And I wondered if that would be spread across more gardens rather than focused on fewer, a fewer number of larger gardens. Yes, it certainly would. I mean, the, the great change that has occurred in um, the history of gardens, although it's not usually seen in this way, is the English suburbs. That with the creation of the suburbs and indeed of the larger towns in the 19th and early and 20th centuries, a vast amount of land uh, um, that had previously been farmland uh, was turned into um, suburban houses and with their large gardens. Um, and that is that was really uh, the biggest transformation of the landscape of England that's been created by the garden industry. Uh, the earlier, uh, the great estates, with their gardens were um, certainly extremely important and they they produced other changes to the landscape but collectively they certainly weren't as um, as big um, an increase in in garden um, um, space if you like as the suburbs were so it is yeah it has been a very big change and in between the, the gardens and the suburbs there were the villas of 
uh, particularly middle class villas of late Georgian and Victorian England, which we don't usually think about because most of them were around the towns um, and they've essentially been um, taken over by the growth of the towns in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries so that we don't see them any longer. Um, so, yes, there have been very big changes, but I think the, the ultimate effect is that we're spending more money probably than we were before. Mm. So you start the book, obviously you have to start it somewhere, and you start it with um, uh, Charles II popularising garden making. And I wondered, was he particularly influential, and do you think he's influenced the way that we garden still today? Well, I think he was particularly influential, yes. I mean, he was clearly very interested, as indeed his his parents had been, and previous English monarchs in gardens. Um, He seems to have spent some time in exile um, looking at gardens and visiting gardens of the particularly French and and Low Countries aristocracy. Um, So he clearly was interested in gardens, and... um, as soon as he took up the throne again in 1660, he began making gardens, among all the other things he had to do. Um, and certainly the creation of, initially, uh, St. James's Park with its lake um, was a, an important model for the um, English aristocracy at the time. And it's clear that, that the, the royal patronage, if you like, of gardening uh, and of the nascent garden industry was very important in, in getting all that um, work underway. One of the things that struck me reading the book was that uh, historically gardens seem to have been where rich, as probably in, in, for the majority men, would spend their wealth. Um, and obviously it was a form of conspicuous consumption, but I found myself wondering you know, to what end? To what end did they spend all of the the money that they did on these gardens? Was it just purely a status symbol? Certainly, um, after the time of Charles II, and by the time you get into the um, Georgian kings, who were all also very interested in gardens, as were uh, their queens in most cases, um, it certainly was was a status symbol. um, But it was also, I think something that you were expected to do. Um, There were probably three or four hundred estates of at least 10,000 acres in England in the 18th century. And essentially, going along with the the status of being a a large estate owner were the obligations that went with that. And one of the obligations, social obligations, if you like, uh, was to create a and, and maintain a garden. So I think certainly there was um, uh, peer pressure, if you like, uh, to have a garden and to keep it in good order. Um, I think, however, that there are you know, a lot of them give every sign of being very interested and um, enjoying garden making. Um, I mean, if you think of Charles Hamilton at Payne's Hill or um, uh, Lord Cobham at Stowe or a whole range of other um, uh, gardeners in the early and mid-18th century, uh, they clearly were extremely interested in uh, what they were creating. Uh, You know, you don't spend your time littering the landscape of Stowe in a nice sense with um, temples and, and um, Gothic ruins and all kinds of and grottos and so on, unless you actually enjoy doing it. Um, and the same could be said of, of Henry Hall at Stourhead and, and numerous others. Um, so that the uh, I don't think one should discount the enjoyment that they and in many cases, their wives certainly got. We know much less about what their wives were up to because everything was always attributed to the man. But I, I think there is evidence that there's a lot of the, the women of these households were interested in gardens as well. 
And the other factor that you have to remember is that although we are amazed, or I'm still amazed, at the amount of money that people did spend on their gardens, in most cases it was really quite a small fraction of their income. So that, um, you know, they could do it without, um, in most cases, uh, getting into financial difficulties. Yes, they were phenomenal amounts that they spent. Um, and thinking about gardens that were open more to the public, so public parks, um, when did they come into being? And what was the thinking behind them when they were introduced? Um, were they the result of other changes in, in land use and ownership? Um, well, there's a multi- there's, a, there's several different motives for the uh, earlier public parks. I mean, the, the first park probably uh, was the Royal Victoria Park in Bath, um, which was 18, in 1830. Um, and that one was really as a tourist attraction. They wanted to attract people back to Bath, which had become much less fashionable than it had been in the uh, Napoleonic era, the era of, of, of Jane Austen. Um, by the 1830s, they were finding it more difficult to attract visitors, and that was probably one of the motivations. Then you you also had in the in the 1830s and 1840s a number of parks that were essentially created for commercial purposes. Um, they um, places like Birkenhead Park um, and Regent's Park in London were um, laid out with a park in the centre. Uh, to provide an, an attraction, and then uh, villas, quite expensive houses and villas, round the outside in most cases. Um, and um, Birkenhead, for example, cost about £50 million in modern values, which was uh, paid for by selling off the uh, land around it. Um, but So there's got these commercial motives, but you've also got, from the 18... 18- 30s onwards also, um, philanthropic motives, if you like. The, um, the, uh, there was parliamentary, um, agitation in the 1830s to provide open space for the working classes, and that produced in 1841, um, a grant of, um, several million pounds to parks in London and other towns around the country. Um, and then um, that, if you like, philanthropic motive, providing uh, a space for the uh, the working classes and to keep them out of the pubs, sometimes explicitly, after the 1840s and 1850s, really the um, uh, motivation continues to be to provide an open space for the population of these countries, uh, of these towns. and. Um, uh, then it's taken over, the motivation is taken over by the municipal authorities and you get the, the, the great growth of municipal parks um, and extremely elaborate expenditure on the parks um, by a number of local authorities all over the country. And that continued really until it was wrecked by austerity uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, which has had a terrible effect on many of these parks. Yeah. And thinking about the working classes and how they use the public spaces, I think one of the things that surprised me in the book was the trends around people growing their own fruit and vegetables, um, particularly the working classes. And I I wanted to ask, have we always supplemented our diets with food from gardens and allotments? And if not, why hasn't this been the case when we've clearly had the space and the soil and the climate to do so? Well, I think it depends who you're talking about. Um, I mean, there is a reasonable amount of evidence of uh, expenditure on fruit and vegetables, uh, either by um, growing it yourself in your gardens, which was the most expensive way of doing it, or buying it from uh, commercial suppliers. Um, For the middle and upper classes from the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Um, I mean, they bought, they could buy fruit and vegetables, as could the working classes, from the 
uh, market gardens which can be seen around London and other towns from the, the late medieval period. So there's been a commercial trade in fruit and vegetables for a very, very long time. And um, uh, for, for many people, it, it became clear, if it wasn't clear originally, that it was actually cheaper and easier to buy fruit and vegetables from the market gardens than it was to uh, grow it themselves. For the upper classes, they they didn't mind about how much it cost, and they wanted the uh, they created the, the the tremendous walled kitchen gardens, which we all marvel at when we visit them at National Trust properties and so on. Um, they created them really as another kind of status symbol. They were completely uneconomic. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about the costs of, uh, growing pineapples or, um, the, the other fruit prized by the 18th and 19th century aristocracy, you're spending hundreds of pounds on each pineapple. It's, it's just in, in modern values. It's, um, it is another status symbol. So, as I say, for the upper classes, it's a status symbol. For the middle classes, they did do a bit of fruit and vegetable growing. If you look at um, John Claudius Loudon's work in the early 19th century, he discusses at some length the uh, possibilities for growing fruit and vegetables in middle-class gardens, but mostly says it's not worth it financially. Uh, they were doing it because they liked the taste or they liked the exercise or what have you. But they certainly did eat some fruit and vegetables, not not the range that we do nowadays, and bought most of them from um, Covent Garden Market and other markets around the country. As far as the working classes are concerned, all the evidence is that, that fruit and vegetables formed an extremely small part of their diet. Um, a great deal of their expenditure goes on uh, bread, um, and uh, other expenditure goes on, on a small amount of expenditure on meat and so on like that, um, dairy products. Um, vegetables are a tiny part of their diet. Um, and uh, I don't think that they grew much of it for themselves. Um, although uh, people always think of allotments, and allotments were introduced from the late 18th, early 19th centuries, Again, to a large extent, to keep people out of the pubs. Um, again, a, a very small proportion of the population had allotments, um, and I don't think they may therefore made a significant contribution to um, overall diets. No. Sorry, that's a complicated answer, but it's um, it's a complicated topic. Yes, yeah, and it was a fascinating one. Uh, and as I say, I found it surprising. Um, so thinking about people who were growing pineapples and other exotic uh, fruit and vegetables and who were growing things out of season using glass houses and, and all sorts of devices, really, um, in your book, you talk about technical technological advances that were made in the way that gardens ran. Um, and I think that perhaps they actually expanded they started life in the garden uh, and then they expanded to uh, outside the world of horticulture um what were some of the kind of main things that that were trialed in the horticultural world that then got rolled out beyond that well i think the two things that really um originated in the horticultural world which we are now very familiar with as firstly central heating and secondly glass uh, clad and um, glass and iron and steel buildings, uh, which of course is, is the main, one of the major ways of, of building nowadays, particularly of office blocks and so on. Um, the central heating originated from the need to heat plants, particularly the, the greens, the, uh, citrus fruits in particular, uh, which were very much prized by uh, 17th and 18th century um, uh, gardeners, and that uh, led to the creation of greenhouses and um, later orangeries. Um, and those had to, in many cases in the English climate, had to be heated. 
Um, and therefore, the, there's a period throughout the 18th century in which there are, and early 19th century in which there are um, experiments in how to heat greenhouses uh, with with different um, architectural styles and so on, um, and different different mechanisms, uh, hot air and uh, steam and and, um, uh, and well, originally charcoal and other things, which had the disadvantage of uh, tending to suffocate the gardeners. Um, the so you get a, a, a whole hundred years of experimentation on central heating in um, gardens before anybody really put them into their houses. And of course, um, it took another uh, century and a half before central heating um, <coughs> became normal in domestic houses. Uh, throughout that whole period, um, central heating had been developed moved from from large bore to small bore pipes, for example, uh, in the service of greenhouses. So that's one absolute example of a technology that is created in the gardens but then has an enormous impact on the rest of society. Um, the other two which I mention in the book are um, the glass and steel buildings because it's, again, with the creation of the greenhouses that people begin to create buildings clad with glass. Uh, and that begins again in the 18th century, but is then very much developed with the, the epitome of it, of course, which is the Crystal Palace of 1851, which was built by a gardener, Joseph Haxton, and uh, modeled on the, the um, although using slightly different technology, modeled on the uh, greenhouses that he'd established at Chatsworth. So again, and then that that system of, of um, cladding buildings with glass um, developed into the skyscrapers and office box that we see all around us today. And the third innovation, which really um, has an enormous effect on the English landscape uh, and began in the gardens, is uh, water. Um, the the lakes of Southern England are almost entirely, I think entirely, uh, n not natural. They are man-made, and they were made in the service of gardens. Um, people think of, of these lakes nowadays as natural features of, features of landscape, but actually uh, they were created uh, for um, the purposes of gardens and gardening. And uh, then so that the, the the technology of dam making and of, uh, water management generally, um, producing cascades and fountains and so on, is all developed for the gardens and is then later used for um, reservoirs, uh, for um, water and for supplying canals. Um, and then, of course, we some of the recent lakes are from uh, gravel pits. Um, but originally, the technology is very much developed in the gardens. So I think, in that way, gardens have had a huge impact on our society, which most people don't recognise. Yeah, absolutely. And one would assume that with all these advances, the number of the, the, the physical amount of gardeners you needed on site to do the work would decrease. Was that, in fact, the case? Originally, it increases very, very substantially. I mean, um, we don't know how many gardeners there were in the country, that is, people whose principal occupation was gardening, if you like, until the the first census, which gives us the material in 1851. Um, and at that point, there were about um, 85,000 uh, essentially full-time gardeners. There may have been a lot of other people who, who, who did jobbing garden work on their spare time and so on. Um, by the 1930s, by the 1931 census, there were 300,000 gardeners. Um, they were almost all men, and it made up about 2% of the occupied males. Now, that may not seem very much, but it's more than public administration, it's more than the armed services, it's more than the people working in gas, water and electricity industries, so it's a big 
um, big part of the British economy, which has now virtually disappeared, um, or at least uh, that's a slight exaggeration. There are very, very few paid gardeners now. There are, of course, a lot of people who do landscaping work, and in a sense, that's that's to some extent replaced the the disappearing gardeners. Um, so that the the main effect of of um, the technology in the gardens, not just the technology I was talking about, but the, the technology of tools in the gardens, um, all the um, toys that we play with, from um, lawn mowers to robot mowers to um, uh, hedge trimmers and everything else, uh, that r- has really produced the great age, as it is today, of do-it-yourself gardening. Um, but in the past, uh, gardens were, it was a professional occupation and a very important one. So it's, I assume the numbers have decreased because, as you say, people are doing it themselves. Um, yes. It's no longer a separate census category. We don't really know how many people there, there are at the moment. I wondered also how, whether wages were a factor. Had they gone up or down? I don't think they've changed very much in relation to other wages. Uh, certainly in the uh, from most of the uh, data we have for the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, um, the ordinary gardener, if you like, not, not the foreman or head gardener who'd be paid more, but the ordinary gardener was paid roughly the same as an agricultural labourer, uh, maybe a bit more because they often slightly higher skilled um, and it did depend on whether they'd done a, an apprenticeship or um, the equivalent but it's about the same as agricultural labourer and I think if you look at um, the wages of gardeners in the 20th century it probably again is around the average wage for um, semi-skilled uh, working class occupations so I don't think there's been a huge change in in the relative value of a gardener's wage over the centuries. That's interesting. Um, it seemed as if there may have been some relatively rich, maybe garden designers and nursery owners, um, historically. So that was that was quite interesting. Um, the, one of the things that I took from the book was that there are there were many things you mentioned that seem to still manifest today in the profession of horticulture and landscaping at, at you know all of the associated professions um and I I think that we have a lot of hangovers today that may be historical in nature and one of the ones that I picked out as an example was the um that I attended a conference a couple of years back where uh, the issue of commission or kickbacks being paid by nurseries and suppliers to designers and landscapers uh, was an issue and, and it was one that was being argued about. Um, and I think that might have happened in, in years gone by as well. Um, and I thought that was an interesting one to explore. Um, can you just talk briefly about why that became a contentious issue originally? Because I think it's the same the same situation today. Yes, I think, well, I think it certainly was important in the 19th century. The, the evidence that we have is, is of substantial commissions being paid to to uh, head gardeners, for example, for the um, uh, plants and, and uh, equipment that they ordered. Um, there's a, different sources give different amounts, but it seems that it was um, probably at least 15% of an order, if not 25%, would go to um, the head gardener. Um, and I think it becomes contentious because obviously um, the uh, uh, nurserymen felt strongly about um, people uh, getting orders by promising large commissions and so on. And I think also the owners, um, the, um, particularly the middle class owners, I don't think, as I said, that the aristocrats worried too much in those cases, middle class owners looking after their pennies were um, a bit annoyed if they found out that the um, reason why their head gardener is buying plants from a particular nursery rather than another one is because they are getting a kickback. Um, so, yes, I think that is one of many things that um, in which the garden industry hasn't changed very much over the centuries. Um, it's a very 
interesting industry because it hasn't changed in uh, either in structure, if you like. Uh, we've still got uh, designers and nurserymen and gardeners and clients and owners and so on, as we had in in 1660. And in many ways, the, the methods that are used um, haven't changed very much. If you look at it, but the tools that were used in the late 17th century, and they're not very different from the tools that are used today, other than the, the mechanized ones that we now have. Um, so it's a, it's a very unusual industry in the sense that it hasn't changed very much, and kickbacks probably haven't changed very much either. <laughs> no, and I think people are still arguing over them. <laughs> so given the fact that it hasn't changed particularly in, in over the centuries, um, Based on your research, can you see any significant economic trends on the horizon related to gardening? Well, not really. I mean, obviously, it's an exaggeration to say there haven't been changes. There have been changes, uh, a huge, huge changes in the technology of plant growing um, have have taken place um, so that all the, the plug plants and um and container grown plants that we uh, are used to buying at nurseries today didn't didn't really exist in the past. So there have been quite significant, very significant changes. Um, no, I think that the, if you like, the, the the current crisis, the COVID crisis, has shown that the people in Britain and in many other countries, because I don't think Britain is really exceptional in this respect. Um, are very keen on gardening, enjoy gardening. Um, there are all kinds of motives for why we engage in gardens, just as there were for the aristocrats of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, um, but enjoyment, as well as competition and putting one over the neighbours and so on, is, um, is still a very important motive. So I would have thought that that, uh, you know, something that has lasted, as far as we can tell, for at least 350 years, about which is something you can't say about many other things, um, uh, is likely to carry on. But I'm an economic historian, not a predictor. <laughs> that is fair enough. <laughs> and and I, I understand completely what you're saying about uh, the, his, the history side of it. Um, but one of the things that, that does get talked about in the industry is that the fact that we may bring, talking specifically of plant growing, that we may bring it back to kind of home shores rather than dealing so much with particularly continental nurseries in terms of plant supply. Um but we haven't got the infrastructure anymore really t- to do that. But again, do you think that's a possibility that our own nursery trade might pop back up again? Well, I don't really see why not, um, given that, you know, we're not... Um, uh, the other countries from which we get most of our uh, plants and other parts of Europe are not really significantly different from us. The, the, the Dutch bulb industry isn't isn't significantly different from growing bulbs in East Anglia. So I don't quite understand why. I know this is a topic I should have gone into, but I just didn't have the space to go into it. I don't quite why um, the uh, supply of plants uh, has moved so far overseas. And therefore, I don't really understand why it couldn't come back again. But it's a question, you know, most most aspects of foreign trade, which is what this is, are a question of comparative advantage in the sense that if it's slightly cheaper to create plants in uh, uh, Holland or to um, grow fruit and vegetables in Spanish polytunnels, then it only needs to be slightly cheaper for that to happen than it would be in England for the trade to move overseas. But, you know, on the other hand, climate change will have an effect, um, as it is with, with vineyards. I don't think anybody expected 30, 40 years ago that there would be so many uh, great vineyards in southern England. So I think there are things will change. Um, um, and um, one of the changes may be that a bit of the a bit of the industry will, will will be repatriated. Yes, I do hope our own nurseries can grow and flourish in the coming years. But I realise many things will need to change, both the behaviour of consumers and the way nurseries operate. 
I'd like to say very many thanks to Sir Roderick for his book and for taking the time to speak to me about it. The paperback version is actually out on the 5th of November. And thanks to you as well for listening. Now more than ever, I'm avoiding social media. So please can I ask you a favour? If you are brave enough to go wading into social media, perhaps you could share my posts and episodes. If you don't want to or are unable to contribute to the GoFundMe or Patreon pages, but you like the content, please could you share it with others and leave me a review where you get your podcasts. It costs nothing but a little bit of time and if you get benefit from the guests who take the time to pass on their knowledge, I think it's a fair exchange. Thank you. And finally, here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a bug that is the bane of the weatherboarded house owner. By late autumn, nights have become longer than day and as temperatures fall, the risk of frost has returned. It's now the time of year that most insect species will have reached a dormancy stage in their lives and are tucked away within their habitats as eggs, larvae, pupae or adults, hoping to escape the mortal dangers that a severe winter could pose. Some of these insects, however, will have discovered the parts of our homes where it's dry, cool yet frost-free provide the ideal location for sitting out the winter months allowing them to sleep undisturbed until they awaken and emerge the following spring. It's common, for example, to discover a queen wasp, a lacewing or a housefly hidden away in a loft where it's been able to squeeze in through a gap under the eaves and perhaps even find its way into the Christmas decoration box. However, some of these overwintering insects are a little more brazen and will appear to have seriously infested our homes. One of these is the cluster fly, which, as its name suggests, congregates in groups to hibernate through the winter months, often in lofts and cavity walls, and often in very large numbers. Although adult cluster flies look very similar in appearance to common house flies, they only really feed on nectar and ripe fruit, and pose no health threats to us. They do, however, lay their eggs into grassland soil where their larvae predate and feed on earthworms. At the end of summer, though, vast numbers of adult cluster flies can emerge from the grassland and begin to gather in increasing numbers on the south-facing walls of nearby houses that they have chosen for their winter refuge. As the sun sets, they crawl up the walls into crevices under the eaves and onto the roof space, where they cluster together to remain undisturbed over the winter months. Occasionally, cluster flies that have settled in warmer spots might awaken during the winter and become a nuisance as they fly around the house. Otherwise, they will wait until spring to become active again, often swarming round windows to try and escape. Removing cluster flies from a home is not always necessary since they won't damage the house and should disperse on their own after winter. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.